Um, uh, again, my name is uh, for joining me tonight and uh, coming out to this uh, virtual presentation. Um, a little bit about um, my past. Um, I am the community engagement manager for Port Huron Museums. So that's just a um, center um, up here in Port Huron, which makes a lot of sense for Port Huron Museums. But I've spent my entire uh, working career in museums. I've worked down in Dearborn. I've spent some time working um, up in the Straits of Mackinac for the state parks. Um, so I've kind of been bouncing all around the state and museums have been my career to at least one museum. There are more museums in the United States than there are uh, McDonald's. Uh, so they, uh, it's a crazy fact, but true. Um, so museums are very popular. Here's a nice picture of, of the Carnegie Center for Wheels. And maybe a little bit uh, later on uh, in the presentation. But um, I wanna talk first about um, the history of museums because they go back maybe further than you might think. Uh, as well as, hey, and then I thought it can end things because I know when I'm always learning about somebody else's career, somebody else's field, what I always find interesting are controversies. I mean, that's kind of the, you know, exciting stuff that gets you to talk, gets you for interesting controversies in the museum. You might not think there are that many, but uh, we'll get to see those. So, um, museum, like, well, a good place to start with something is always uh, the name. Where does the name museum comes from? Well, it's actually a temple to the muses. So if we hire all of these different things, um, if there are any uh, maybe millennials watching, you might remember the muses more as, you know, the, the guys from Hercules, the ladies from Hercules who are on the base. But yeah, it's, it's the muses, a lot of museums. They look like a uh, a temple. Uh, Greek architecture is really popular uh, with museums. In fact, I think a lot of the icons or symbols for museum uh, wind up being uh, looking like a Greek temple front. So the, muses. Um, so the oldest museum um, that we actually know about was actually in Incest, uh, and she lived about 600 BC or so, um, and in ancient Ur, so that's modern day Iraq. And it's actually pretty neat. So um, uh, it's in some ways, uh, the world's first tourist of the Royal Palace, and in a, in a Galdi Nana's museum uh, was nearby. And how you might ask, you know, this was uh, discovered basically in the 1920s, there were a few written records about it, but uh, discovered in the 1920s, how do we know? Uh, this kind of collection of artifacts that seem to be regularly arrayed in the archeological record. And so that's, uh, pretty unusual because this is what they found. This doesn't uh, particularly look like, you know, much of anything to maybe the untrue of this research. They were finding artifacts mixed together. Um, so some that were, you know, maybe up to a thousand years older and some of the other ones, they're on the same room. They said, wait a second, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. This would be like finding a computer in George Washington's tent in the same room. You're like, what's going on with that? And uh, what really cylinder here, uh, one very similar to it, and it's actually the world's first museum label. Uh, so it had uh, descriptions of some of those artifacts in three different languages. So just like we see museum labels today, they had those all the way back. Um, a lot really weren't a formalized thing until it's kind of a collection of artifacts, maybe a repository of, of old and valuable things. In some ways, um, that's what maybe kings and emperors and conquerors would do, take the spoils of uh, war, uh, bring them all together in one spot, and you could go look at them. But Really, you don't start to see the, the origin of the modern museum uh, doesn't start until uh, into the 17th century, so the 1600s. And that's when we have uh, cabinets of Kinderkammer. Um, they are um, usually smaller collections, not like giant palaces like um, you would have seen uh, in the ancient world, but um, rich people's smaller rooms, collections of oddities, curios, things of this thing I found, or somebody brought this to me. That's what we're thinking. It's in some ways like um, a lot of people, like I know at my house, I've got almost like a, a cabinet of curiosity. I keep, you know, weird little things I want to show. Cabinets of curiosity. When this is actually a painting uh, of one uh, from like the 1630s. And you can see um, it was a collection of, there's some paintings, there's a skull, there's lots of like weird roots, lots of natural phenomena. My background is in uh, historical museums. I'm talking about history museums, but they're all types. Uh, science museums, these are really the origins of, of science museums as well as history museums and art museums. Now, art museums are a little different uh, than other museums. I don't really have a whole lot of experience with art. I'm not an art, uh, you know, velvet painting. So I'm sure I'd probably get laughed out of the DIA if I asked to be a curator there or anything. Maybe they'll open up a velvet painting lane and that'd be nice. But I, I really wanna talk about the history of general concept of museums uh, as a whole. So here's another uh, one of these uh, cabinets of curiosity. You can see this one's bigger. This is like a closet of curiosity, I suppose. And you can really see the oddities. There's skeletons, there's shells, there's um, things that are starting to be arranged on uh, shelves, which are pretty neat. You, know, you don't see that um, before this. It's just, you know, the person who made the cabinet probably knew what everything was or had an idea anyway and wanted to share that. But up throughout uh, Europe and uh, with, again, wealthy uh, patrons who'd set these up. Um, here's another example of an even bigger cabinet of curiosity. You can see these are getting bigger uh, throughout the 17th century. I always like this one, the same last name as me. Uh, he was a, a Jesuit thinker uh, in the 1650s and 60s. There have um, kind of been a, renown, a renewed interest in him as of late. They said uh, he was the last man to know everything. So much knowledge in the world today, 
then no one could know everything. No one could be an expert. Like somebody like Leonardo da Vinci, where he was a sculptor, he's a scientist, he's a mathematician, he's an engineer, he does all of these things equally well. Well, obviously as the quote goes away, but uh, Kircher here was really one of the last guys that was probably a legitimate master of everything. He knew a little bit about everything. And you can see uh, he's got kind of a whole hallway, a whole wing here, uh, exclusively for his friends, other uh, wealthy patrons. Uh, this was not something that was generally open to the public. Uh, but one of the neat things we can see some from some of the drawings, he was really interested by uh, sound. And you can see uh, they, some people credit uh, Kircher with the invention of the speaking horns, the, the megaphone, where you uh, roll up a cone and direct sound uh, in one direction or another. And you can see he had uh, basically statues. Uh, so it was like the stat, you could shout, talk to the statue and people outside could hear, or uh, the statue would be able to reproduce that sound from outside. And it was an interactive exhibit. You know, we think fun exhibits are the ones you get to touch, you get to poke stuff. You know, I've got a lot of friends in the museum world, and I will tell you that uh, probably nine out of ten of them said they got into museums because they wanted to touch stuff. You're not allowed to do that if you're just visiting, but if you work there, you get to you know, poke the old thing. It's really fun, especially in science museums that are interactive. And that goes all the way back, uh, like you can see here, to the 1650s and the 1660s. So at that, uh, by, by the 17th century, um, there were some museums that were at the Vatican's museum. Uh, when we think about the ancient and, well, especially the medieval world, uh, probably the most of uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, they've got a lot of money, they've got a lot of power, they've got um, lots of art commissioned for them. Uh, and so they actually opened some of this up to the public for the very first time. The idea that, you know, Joe Roman, who's in Rome, could go see, he's not, you know, out toiling in a field or a factory somewhere. Uh, we can kind of credit um, the Vatican Museum as being the first museum open uh, to the general public. Uh, and again, that's that's into the 17th century. As, as time kind of moves along, again, we see these um, collections larger. Uh, this museum right here, this is the uh, Ashmolean aristocrat. He had a lot of money, he had a giant mansion, and he had a very uh, large collection. Still one of the nicest museums for sure in the world. And basically it filled uh, eventually his entire house. And it's something that uh, even middle class come and see uh, the collections. And it still consists of animal oddities, skeletons, interesting to look at or make it go, ah, that's neat, um, would be in the halls of places like the Ashmolean. So, uh, the accessibility was becoming uh, more and more open uh, to more and more people. Um, one of the uh, museums that's truly open to the museums in the world. Now, the Louvre was obviously a big palace right up until the 1790s. During the French Revolution, uh, the people uh, really forcibly opened this one up. Um, and it became, the people were really interested in having uh, access to everything that you would see uh, in the museum here. All of this artwork that had been hoarded away for uh, the wealthy and the aristocrats. But, um, the Louvre is still one of the most popular, if not possibly the most visited museum in the world. Now, it is typically an art museum, what we think of it. It's got things like the Mona Lisa, you know, Milo, things like that. The Mona Lisa, I've even heard tell, they might try and make a spot to see the Mona Lisa. It really kind of clogs up traffic flow in the rest of the museum. I've never been. I'd like to go sometime, but um, that might be coming down the pipe in the realm of uh, new museums. And we talked a lot about European museums. What's going on in um, the rest of the world? Um, it's pretty interesting. Um, you start to see a lot more uh, connectivity between Asia and um, the Western world, uh, Europe, in into the 18th and early 19th century. And it's really neat to see um, there was no concept of a museum uh, in places like China prior to kind of meeting the Europeans. It was a very European thing to do. Um, there were places like the Forbidden Palace that you can see here. Uh, the Forbidden Palace uh, was not a place where the public was getting into. It was not a place that even most of the wealthy or elite, uh, these translations um, that you see in Chinese for like, what do you call a museum? Because obviously that comes from a Greek root. And some of the translations come back as the bone amassing building or you know, hall of military feats, courtyards of treasures, the house of expensive things. And those are to uh, the 19th century. But I want to talk about what we're all waiting for, American museums. Right? So this is uh, all of us watching probably from the United States, I think, although we are online, maybe we have some international visitors, but um, let's talk about the history, uh, history. but uh, actually in a lot of ways, uh, Americans are kind of pioneers in the uh, museum field. Uh, so this is Charles Wilson Peale. Uh, he was a painter uh, who lived in Baltimore and uh, bounced around, I think, the East Coast in a few different places, but Philadelphia is where he eventually found it. I love this painting. I really want drapes like that, I think, for my house. Uh, but you can see he's lifting up this kind of veil and showing uh, all of the different uh, animals and paintings he has on display. You can even see uh, in the background. Um, and he's, he's welcoming people in to see all these things. So he was a painter, but he felt that since Europe had all of these homes by this point for the wealthy, that there should be one for the American public, this museum, uh, for a reasonable price, of course. He was charging money. Uh, here's an example of one of the original buildings that he's uh, in. This one is in uh, the city of Baltimore. Um, like I so said, he was in uh, Philadelphia because he winds up having 
Um, uh, quite, there's Rembrandt Peel, uh, Titian Peel. Um, there's there's like half a dozen of them. Uh, Raphael Peel, I think, is another one. And uh, anyway, they're all actually painters in their own right. Most of them. Um, so uh, his uh, son that kind of really takes on the museum industry by uh, Rembrandt uh, Peel. Um, now I put this up here because Rembrandt Peel really takes on the mantle of the museum. He's running it. Uh, into the early part of the 19th century. So we're talking the first couple decades of uh, the 1800s. First museum uh, to use Linnaean nomenclature. So that's basically, you know, those Latin phrases for uh, animals. Like my favorite is gorilla gorilla is the scientific name for the gorilla. But Homo sapiens, the first museum to use that to identify uh, all the animals they had on display. And they had uh, some giant like woolly mammoths on display. Um, Thomas Jefferson actually got into an argument with this guy, um, Georges Leclerc, uh, the Comte, that, oh, Americans have bad air over there, and all of their animals are small and weak and tiny, and Europe is really quite superior to that. Thomas Jefferson did not like that. He did not like that idea. And he actually runs, How, try this on for size. This is one of the animals from America. Do you like that? So kind of an interesting uh, back and forth, uh, slow rolling um, battle of the wits there. Uh, but here on the left, this is Rembrandt, this is a self portrait painting of George Washington that you've all seen on the dollar bill and everywhere else. So again, these are well-to-do people. They're connected. They know uh, just about everybody. So Rembrandt Peel um, basically is running this museum until uh, the 37. Uh, there's a panic. Uh, Martin Van Buren is president and the economy collapses like it tends to do every 20 years or so. And he can't make the museum work anymore. People aren't coming in and not paying money. So he winds up selling to this guy. Now, uh, I'm usually uh, used to have who this is uh, by the picture, but I'm guessing maybe some of you don't know. But um, here's another helpful hint if you didn't get it from the picture alone. And if you really don't know, it, it's Hugh Jackman. Uh, it's no, it's P.T. Barnum. Um, Barnum, who is undeniably most famous for the circus, we and Barnum and Bailey's circus, uh, but really for almost uh, all of his adult life, uh, P.T. Barnum didn't have anything to do with the circus. He ran a museum. Uh, he bought Rembrandt Peel's museum about 18, which is just one of my favorite things in history. I think it's so fascinating for so many reasons. But this is located in uh, New York. It's in lower Manhattan. And if you're visiting the United States in the 1850s, one place to visit in the United States for international travelers. So you have to go see Barnum's American Museum in New York. It is the number one attraction basically in the Western Hemisphere at this point. Um, and you'll see why. So here's an actual, you can see he, uh, unfortunately it's a black and white photo, but you can imagine there's a lot of color all over this building, it's bright, it's attractive. This is the number one place to visit. Uh, it's a rather dystopian 1850s, the building next door has got a big sign for importing human hair to make wigs and the like, but uh, his museum is enormous. It's uh, you know this five, six story building right in the middle of New York. And he's got all sorts of oddities, like mummies in the 1830s and 40s. They just kind of discovered the, they discovered the Rosetta Stone during the Napoleonic campaigns in Egypt, 1805, 1804, and um, they had hauled that back then. I think they found it like 1798. But um, they, they would, had finally figured out and learned hieroglyphics. So people were really fond of Egypt. So displaying mummies was fascinating. Um, there were things like Daniel Lambert. Uh, Daniel Lambert was for a long time like, the largest human who ever lived. And um, they had his clothes. Uh, he had obviously died um, a few decades before the museum opened. But they had clothes and uh, Barnum had a wax figure made. And while that was interesting, he then started bringing in real live. Today, I know I would, but he was bringing in live um, oddities. Um, there's a reason we associate P.T. Barnum with things like the Freak Show. Um, these were natural oddities, people who were, you know, uh, compensated. Uh, we saw earlier he was standing there with uh, Tom Thumb, his cousin. He knew him. Barnum actually got his start before he was able to buy um, the museum. Uh, Barnum got his start uh, by leasing a slave. You could you could do that. It was an enslaved older woman, and Barnum claimed she was 150 uh, and toured around the country with her, uh, even in the free states, because, again, he was leasing this enslaved person. He didn't buy her, so he didn't own her, so he could take her through the north uh, and showed her. This work, he made a lot of money at it. She eventually died. P.T. Barnum, ever the opportunist, uh, actually sold tickets to a live autopsy of her for 25 cents a piece. The doctor basically said, this woman wasn't 160. She was like 75 or 80. Uh, but P.T. Barnum then said, oh, well, no, the real woman, she went on tour in Europe. She's still alive. But that's that's P.T. Barnum. He really liked to mix um, truth who lived in residence at the museum. I think today would be uncomfortable with seeing, you know, live kind of oddities like this in person as an exhibit. We don't think of other people as something to go and, you know, pay to gawk at. Um, but that's definitely what, they're the uh, women with the um, large, like the Afros, uh, but they were had very, very pale skin, green eyes. They came from the Caucasus. They're kind of from a, a 
a non-existent ethnic group anymore, but you could see here, tall people here, woman standing there on the left, seven and a half feet. They could do a double take, I think even on the streets uh, today. There were people like Josephine uh, Ophelia, uh, who was the bearded lady of Genoa. You know, these are the kind of things that we associate with the circus side show today, but they were, of Aang were actually competitors um, to uh, Barnum for a long time. Chang and Ang were the um, conjoined twins. So the reason that um, sometimes people refer to conjoined twins as Siamese twins, they were from uh, Siam, modern day Thailand. Uh, they had actually been touring. We could do a whole slideshow just on them. They wound up actually buying a property in South Carolina and they were slave owners. Um, they actually ran into trouble after the Civil War and had to go to Barnum for some more money. But in the 1850s, they took up a row. And actually with them, um, they would just have a polite conversation with you, introduce you to their wives. They married a pair of sisters. And they wound up having something like 20 children between the two of them. So they were, uh, they were pretty busy with their time. Uh, but they, you could get lots of artifacts, both uh, real, like we saw in the Cabinets of Curiosity, and some fabricated, like the Fiji Mermaid. I think it was one of the most famous that they fabricated, where it was just like sewing a monkey skeleton to half a fish. And that was the Fiji Mermaid. It was all in the way uh, that you saw in 1850s that was appearing in newspapers in New York at the time. Ancient sarcophagi, 3,000 years old, Egyptian mummies, family of Peruvian mummies. So those would have been real. And then obviously you've got things like the Fiji Mermaid, which was not. Now, um, what happened to Barnum's Museum? This is, I think, worth a diversion because history, uh, P.T. Barnum's Museum burned down in June of uh, 1865. So this is an era right after the American Civil War. The American Civil War had ended that spring. This is that summer. So let's just keep that exactly how um, the fire started. I, I, some accounts suggest it was in a restaurant nearby and the fire quickly spread. Uh, but in this kind of era where everyone's using the kerosene lamps and things like that, fires can get out of hand uh, in a hurry. Now, Barnum himself was not in town. It's away when this happened. Uh, I recently watched the movie with Hugh Jackman, and I was pretty disappointed. They didn't really crack a history book when they wrote that one. I think they spent more time on the pop music uh, than on uh, the history. He wasn't there that day. Um, the fire broke out, you know, immediately. There were a couple of almost competing fire companies that arrived. There was the Metropolitan Fire Department, there was a the City Fire Department, and there's some reports of like a fist fight between the two of them as to who was going to put this fire out, who was going to have the honor and uh, to, to get to put the fire out. So immediately they began pouring water into a, a newspaper uh, clipping. Um, one of the things that uh, unfortunately I can't find too many images of Inside, in addition to the number of people who were living in residence at the uh, Barnum Museum and all of the artifacts, he also had a menagerie of things from elephants and tigers and snakes to Barnum owner. He was the first person to have whales in tanks. It's actually pretty sad. Uh, I don't think we would accept this today at all. If people got mad at SeaWorld. They'd be very mad at P.T. Barnum because he basically put these whales in a tank and he had hooked up pumps to come in. Uh, to a couple of these large whales he had in tanks that you could see. But uh, in an era before television, even before widespread newspapers and illustrations, things like that, the idea of seeing a live whale would be pretty phenomenal. So breaking open the tanks um, with uh, axes, they smash open the glass tanks to spread the water out to try uh, and put out the fire. It obviously uh, does not work. Uh, so obviously building, people are rushing to the building from the rest of the city. Uh, people like... Uh, um, the firefighters are coming in and out. They're doing their best to rescue some of the people. There's accounts of one firefighter that's kind of illustrated here. They said his ax that has, was trapped in a room, and then he had to carry a 400-pound woman out on his shoulders, which would have been just something. It's just absolute pandemonium. Other animals are escaping the retreat, and a police officer actually shot the elephant with a pistol, um, which just made the elephant angry. That was probably not a good idea on the part of uh, that elephant. So one of the other people have gathered and they said, this is America's most important treasures. We need to save them. What do we do? Well, one brave man said, I will run inside. I will save them. Now remember, this is right after the Civil War. He runs inside and we know that there was a large wax museum. This was another kind of new idea, though, just like at Madame Tussauds. The man who ran inside, who bravely ran in to save American treasures, was actually a Confederate sympathizer, uh, which did not go over well with the crowd just after the Civil War had ended, only a couple of months after. The only um, thing that he saved at the museum was the wax figure of Jefferson Davis. Uh, and this enraged the crowd so much that they hung him in effigy. So they they hanged him on a so uh, it's it's pandemonium. There were things like I mentioned Jumbo and the elephant. Now Jumbo was not there. Jumbo actually comes a little bit later. Jumbo was a specific elephant and was noted for its size. Jumbo was unfortunately killed in a train accident, and um, they had him stuffed. Um, and he was such an enormous. We're talking about that elephant. Jumbo was not a word in the lexicon prior to this elephant. But uh, just an amazing haul of uh, treasures that you would have seen. Like an absolute pandemonium on that day would have been something to see if I ever had a time machine. I think I might go back and maybe witness what was going on that day. In town, however, uh, there was another museum uh, that got its start in the uh, 1840s uh, in the United States, and that's the Smithsonian. So James Smithson actually never came to the United States. He was a British uh, philanthropist who left money um, to uh, the United States to create this institution that bears his name. The um, 
And so to increase knowledge um, is basically their mission statement. Uh, so they had uh, kind of a pretty big time with, um, well, hopefully we're still good there. I might have had a little internet disruption. Um, they set up a series of museums. This is the castle. This is the one we know. It's mostly actually administrative buildings now, but it's uh, like the History Museum. This is uh, one of my favorite exhibits in the History Museum. In the 1830s, they made this uh, giant statue of uh, George Washington for the Capitol uh, in the very sea and things like that. Um, but people were very uncomfortable with the idea of George Washington being shirtless, even though all of those ancient Greek statues are shirtless, and they actually hid him away for a very long time. But now you can go see him at the Smithsonian uh, History. Uh, at least part of it, part of that is in DC, part of it's at the uh, actual airport there. Um, there is the uh, African American History Museum, the Native American History Museum, which just opened. It's, I haven't been to it, it's really cool. So all of these are nationally uh, funded museums and they, quite a few of them have shown up in museums go back quite a long way. And they were um, just like in ancient times, a national repository uh, for all sorts of uh, treasures uh, for the country. Everything from the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, George Washington State, things like that. Uh, would go on display. Shift in the way we look at museums into the 20th century. Um, because by the 20th century, the government isn't necessarily the biggest game in town anymore. There are plenty of rich folks again, um, people like uh, the Rockefellers. Uh, but this is actually Colonial Williamsburg. And this is a different type of museum. This was a museum, an open air museum. Now, I worked up at uh, my favorite open air museum in the state of Michigan. I worked at uh, Mackinac State Historic Park on the wall label. It's maybe a collection of buildings, um, a larger collection uh, like that. Um, so this uh, Colonial Williamsburg was uh, the Rockefeller's idea, basically back into the 19 teens and 20s. They, most of Williamsburg, Virginia had one of the greatest collections of 18th century buildings and Rockefeller basically bought the town. Anything of any interest he purchased, he actually tore down an incredible number of buildings from slightly after the colonial period. So if you had a house from 18 torn down, and uh, it is a very large museum consisting of multiple buildings and, of course, uh, costume interpretation. So you have people um, who are, you're dressed in period attire who can talk about history. And that's a very popular form of museum. Now, I have a museum like that. There's one actually very close to home for us. If most of us are probably from the Metro Detroit uh, area. We, many of us have probably been to Greenfield Village. Uh, this was an idea that, unlike Colonial Williamsburg, which already existed on one, he thought was uh, interesting. Everything from you know, Edison's lab uh, to George Washington Carver's house, um, all of the, the Wright Brothers' home, uh, those were all brought to uh, Greenfield Village. And it's, it's in collaboration with the Henry Ford Museum, uh, which is home, as you can see here, to uh, some of America's greatest teens in the 1920s. There were also quite a few uh, rich families who might have had some of these things that would seem like they would belong in the Smithsonian, but they said, I don't like the government so much. I'll give it to Henry Ford, or I'll give it to uh, somebody like that. Um, so you see these prize a great picture. I think everyone in the museum community in Michigan loves this picture of when uh, former President Barack Obama visited and sat on the Rosa Parks bus. What a, a powerful image, and that's a really cool artifact uh, to have. Because ultimately, as much as museums are repositories for items, certainly the way most history museums view themselves, the items, you're saving them for posterity, of course, for future generations. Any good museum person will tell you they're simply there for the future, but they can use those items as a tool uh, to tell a story, to impart a lesson. And so some of the most powerful things you can find at the Henry Ford. Now, of uh, doing definitely a skim of all this. Uh, if anybody wants to talk shop or talk more about museums in the past, I'd love to. I'll take questions at the end or uh, you can uh, look me up. But we're just kind of skimming the surface doing a little survey of the history of museums. History for museums and it's the bicentennial. As we approach, it, approach 1976, this country went insane for history. Uh, people were spending more money to visit historical sites than before. More sites, again, there's some sort of historical society. There's a pretty decent chance it might have been founded sometime around um, the bicentennial. For example, the Port Huron Museums uh, opened up in 1968. Now, it's obviously a little bit before, but people were really hard uh, in the 1970s um, that affected everything. If you remember, if you were alive then, I'm sure you remember it. Now, you've probably seen a lot of pictures how exciting that was. And really the number of museums at that point exploded. They become much still scattered throughout the country, but the idea that every city might have its own is not abnormal. Uh, Port Huron, for example, has five museums in a city of like 28,000 people. We only have two McDonald's, and there are McDonald's. Um, so uh, in Port Huron, for example, I've talked a little bit about um, Port Huron Museum where I work. I'll talk about some of those museums you can find in Port Huron. Things like the Thomas Edison Depot Museum. This is a museum that actually only opened in 2001 or so. The depot where Thomas Edison worked uh, as a boy when he was growing up in Port Huron. So it's a museum dedicated to telling the story of his childhood, some of the accomplishments that Thomas Edison did. It's really cool that it's in uh, that original building. There are things like the Carnegie Center. That's the picture. Museum. And we talk about everything from the history of Port Huron famous people to things like maritime history since Port Huron uh, is legally the maritime capital of the Great Lakes. 
we won that lawsuit. Take that, Buffalo, uh, up on the second floor. So interactive exhibits, again, we talk about how important those become. The Lighthouse, um, this is also relatively newly a museum, only about 10 years old, uh, formerly being run by Port Huron Museums in collaboration with St. Clair County Parks and Friends of the Fort Crasher Lighthouse. There's a duplex. Um, those are, are, are things you can go inside. And this, so you can see uh, Port Huron Museum is kind of a mix between traditional museum and open air museum, I would call uh, the light station here an open air museum because obviously this is you would walk through all of this. There's also things like the light ship Huron, um, which the light ship Huron was the last light ship on the Great Lakes. Uh, if you're not familiar, light ship is like a floating lighthouse. So this north of Port Huron, and um, that's museum. Um, actually, right now we've had some trouble with the high water level. That's its own whole story. But those are, are very typical museums, and obviously I work there. It's my job. To, they're very typical of museums in the United States, and the the variety and breadth of museums uh, is pretty crazy. Oh, we also now have trolley tours. It's another picture I forgot to throw in there. So museums do more than just hang things on the wall or display things. They're active members out into the community to help share uh, and, and in some way shape um, community stories. So I want to talk about some of the coolest museums in the country just to give you an idea. Uh, this is Museum of Bad Art, which is in Boston Art. I mentioned art museums are kind of a different thing um, than history museums and science museums, but this is too good not to share um, some of these niche museums. Um, I love niche museums in 30 or 40 years uh, as more and more niche museums have opened with very specific things like the Neon Museum in uh, Las Vegas or the Velvet Painting Museum in Los Angeles. Um, there's you know, a Pez Museum. There are corporate museums like Hormel has a Spam Museum out in Minnesota, but it goes back why ways. This is the Moot Museum of Medical Oddities. And I threw that in, that's a museum that's still around and you can look at um, medical oddities just to show you in some ways. Some things haven't changed since that, you know, cabinet of curiosity dates 400 years ago. They would have loved this. It was like that, but just much, much bigger. Um, there are things like, uh, I'm sure they, they have a lot of things to say about bobbleheads. I couldn't tell you when the first bobblehead was built, but they could. Um, sometimes, you know, we see frivolous topics like, you know, bobbleheads maybe doesn't have that much kind of a social impact, but there are some museums, uh, like it's the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia, uh, definitely a kind of a, a heavier topic, but one that's very important to explore, one that's very important uh, to look at and examine and reflect on as a society. And they're actually located at Ferris. That's sometimes there's a, a lot of question when you come across an artifact that's unquestionably very racist and you're wondering, you know, what, what do we do with this? Is it something that we can't throw it away, we can't ignore it? Um, this is the kind of institution that would take that in and be able to use that as a teaching tool. Um, there are other museums. Um, this is actually part of the University of Michigan. Many universities have uh, their own museum. And this, we see a, a huge growth of uh, universities in the 20th century, um, both state-run and private, just about all of them have a museum of some kind. Um, this is another really unique one that um, I just couldn't. Burger King Navajo Code Talkers Museum. Um, it's in, um, in Arizona uh, on the uh, Navajo Reservation, and it is... Those are two of my favorite things, Burger King and museums. So this one that's always been on my list to want to go to. I love the idea that there's a museum in you know, Burger King. Um, this is from the uh, Museum of Failure, which is another great, I just, I love that. Um, it's the, the main campus in Sweden, there's another one in Los Angeles, where they talk specifically up the multicolored ketchup. Or um, there was a brief time where Colgate, yes, Colgate, had beef lasagna. There was nothing wrong with the beef lasagna. I'm sure it was very nice, frozen food, just like any of the other frozen lasagnas you can get, but man, yeah, it did not go well. Uh, so it's important to reflect on, on even our failures. And got a great big wall of um, failed Oreo flavors or ones that didn't take off, because boy, there sure are a lot of them. So it's a really interesting, interesting way to look at something like that. There are large museums. The Historic House Museum is a, a type, and you see how people used to live in the past. Uh, obviously, just when everybody has a home, someplace that they live, and getting to look at the way somebody else directly lives is a great use for a museum. Uh, this is uh, Biltmore in uh, North Carolina. I think it might be like the largest residence in the United States, a, a, on, on scale with the European Palace. At the other end of the spectrum of things like the Tenement Museum, uh, which is one of the most popular museums in the city of New York, which you can imagine, there's a lot of museums in New York. The Tenement Museum is actually really cool. They found a tenement untouched. A lot of it had not been updated. And each floor of the Tenement Museum represents kind of a different decade. So there's an 1880s uh, room, there's a 1920s room, a 1940s room, a 1980s room. And you can see the development of the tenement. Certainly a far cry uh, from most popular museums uh, in the country. Um, as we look towards the kind of future of museums, um, things like pop-up museums. This is a pop-up museum. Um, this is one that popped up in, uh, 
Los Angeles. Uh, big cities are popular there, but they're growing. You throw some artifacts in it. You might be there for as little as a day, 24 hours. You might be there for a couple of weeks. You throw something up and move along. Think of it as like a, you know, a spirit Halloween. They, they could show up out of nowhere, take up any building in town. So pop-up museums are, are definitely a thing. And as are virtual museums, we're doing something uh, as much as this is a library program. It's kind of a museum program too, and it's virtual. Uh, virtual museums were kind of growing uh, in some popularity well before anyone had even thought of the word COVID or anything like that. So what exactly the future holds for museums is a good question. I don't want to speculate a whole lot, but I imagine they will be popular uh, for some time as people really tend to value uh, experiences and unique experiences. Museums are typically very unique, telling the stories of different areas, different peoples, um, different... That's, you know, kind of uh, brings us um, around uh, with the history of museums, but... Um, I know you were all wondering, I mentioned earlier, we want to talk about some museum controversies. These are things that I, I love hearing about it, especially from somebody who has, you know, a very niche job from like, oh, what do, what do like, somewhere? What, what controversies do they have in their world? Well, librarians, what's the biggest topic for them? Well, I thought I'd share some of the big museum controversies, a way to talk about kind of their role in society and how um, there's definitely things worth talking about. So uh, a great example of gay uh, controversy. So very shortly, the Enola Gay was the name of the B-29 bomber uh, that was responsible for dropping the atomic bomb on Hiroshima uh, towards the end of World War II. This is something that obviously remained uh, in the United States. In case, uh, the Enola Gay talk about the beginning of the atomic age. And in 1995, there was a big push for a new exhibit because it was the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. Now, an exhibit was where uh, a lot of the focus of the exhibit uh, was on the destructive power of the atomic bombs, uh, boomed over the world of potential uh, atomic war um, since that fateful day back in August of 1945. Now, there was a problem. They, they didn't maybe work as well with their shareholders as possible. This is always a good lesson to be able to tell their own stories. And so um, there's obviously a lot of controversy over, um, over the use of the atomic bomb. Um, and people felt um, that it was wrong to do so. And the museum really tackled this. This is where the problem was. When the museum tackled this other side, they, um, a massive kickback from groups like the American Legion, World War II veterans. There were a lot more World War II veterans in the 1990s than there were today who felt that by focusing an exhibit, by talking about uh, the bad light, and it said, hey, you know, this makes us not look like heroes. And, well, that kind of is the problem. You can see there's lots of you know, political cartoons uh, about the Enola Gay and um, the subject matter that it was. Uh, this uh, Tim Crouch says, do you want to do an exhibit that makes veterans feel good, or do you want an exhibit that will lead our visitors to think about the consequences of the atomic bombing in Japan? Frankly, I don't think we can do both. And it's kind of right. You really can't, um, because sometimes museums are there to make you feel uncomfortable. Um, Probably not too many of those hard-hitting exhibits at the bobble. The Jim Crow Museum might not be a real pick-me-up, but it's still important uh, to have. It's important to address uh, these issues. Eventually, uh, this went all the way to, uh, to Congress because it was a Smithsonian exhibit. This was the federal government. And, and Tim Crouch, um, he resigned. He lost his job over this. And they redid the plane itself, um, so you can only see part of it. They took the wings off and the back off, so they chopped up the plane and, and really did not focus as much on um, the destruction um, and kind of the question of, you know, was this the right thing to do? What were the concepts? doesn't always necessarily tell you what to think, but makes you think, if that makes sense. Uh, going along with that, I have some personal experience with an exhibit that maybe uh, this is you know, ripped from the headlines. This was just a couple of years ago. Uh, when I worked at the Dearborn of Henry Ford um, purchasing the Dearborn Independent, which was a, a newspaper that Henry Ford used um, to promote. Uh, now, this led to um, a magazine that our small museum published in Dearborn. went up to a couple of hundred people. Dearborn historian with an article recognizing um, that um, kind of unfortunate part of Ford's past, something that we felt it's the 100th anniversary um, because figures are complex. Nobody's fully good, nobody's fully bad, but this is certainly a story worth uh, examining and why it's pretty relevant uh, today. So article was written up, the magazines were published, and uh, is this history accurate? This is something that is, is historians will tell you is broadly accepted. This is a picture of Henry Ford um, taking medals uh, from, from the Nazis on his 75th birthday here in Dearborn, 1938, right before World War II. Um, he made a lot of um, with uh, fascist forces in Europe. That wasn't really up for debate. The debate was whether or not this was a story worth re-examining or digging up. And in fact, the uh, mayor of Dearborn, General Riley, uh, he fired the editor of the, the magazine and basically had them to want no one to hear about a story. The best way to do it is try and prevent people from hearing something and it will get out. So this was actually an article that showed up in the New York Times, um, the Times of Israel, Brazil. Um, uh, this is basically uh, when I kind of moved on from this museum, uh, but I was interested in a national story for a small museum and our newsletter that had been censored about a sensitive topic. So this is something that can definitely have, it can happen to the Smithsonian, it can happen to a museum you could count on one hand. Um, so it's, it's very tricky sometimes the way you approach a topic, even when the actual history uh, itself uh, is not in question. 
Uh, this is an exhibit that fortunately has nothing to do with uh, the United States. Also, this guy, Lord Elgin, is the snappy-looking dresser in the double-breasted red coat up there in the right. Um, he kind of gallivanted about the globe, and in the uh, 18-teens, right after the Napoleonic Wars, he went over to Greece, which was then part of all these spots in ancient Athens, as people were really interested in ancient Greece. He saw all of these uh, marbles kind of in ruins, the statues that appeared on um, the Parthenon in the middle of Athens, and he claims that he bought them, uh, you know, paid, paid fair price, got a receipt, had them taken off the way in the British Museum where they've stayed ever since. Now, it is interesting to note that no one can actually find these receipts to prove he even paid for them, let alone he was paying the Ottoman Empire. And um, less than 10 years later, Greece gained its independence from the Ottoman Empire. Maybe he took uh, some of the nicest things he, he took some of the nicest things that we had. Greece began demand these, these marbles back. And this is ongoing. Uh, they still want them back. This is a cultural treasure. Uh, many countries, places like Egypt, have had sent out elsewhere, a lot of them to the United Kingdom, who were kind of overseeing Egypt as a, a colonial overlord. This happens in all, uh, where treasures are ripped out of the country that's colonized and sent back uh, primarily to Europe. And then the question is, where do those objects belong? There's been a new wave of this in places like Syria. Years or decades of turmoil and war, some of their great treasures have been pilfered. Uh, you got into a lot of trouble for pilfering out um, ancient Sumerian texts and um, like uh, scrolls out of um, Iraq uh, illegally. They were, they were looted. You had to give some of those back. So that is a, a question that comes up a lot. It's a question that uh, Black Panther, uh, Killmonger, uh, who... Uh, maybe got maybe not the best name, uh, but Killmonger appears. The opening scene of that movie takes place in a museum where Killmonger is wondering about the provenance, where these objects come from uh, in this museum, and if they were to them. Because if they're not involved in telling their story, those objects are, are, are to tell a story, then maybe they're not the best thing to have on uh, display. So there's a great example of uh, museum controversy in pop culture. And this kind of goes on in the United States as well, I think, under uh, Bill Clinton, called NAG NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. So for a very long time you know, in the United States, there were uh, dozens, if not hundreds of museums across the United States uh, that displayed and remains uh, as the United States, uh, lots of it was built basically on native burial ground, you lined up with these remains, uh, and some of them were sadly put on display. I think it's something that uh, Native Americans, obviously, if you imagine somebody moving into, say, like Arlington National Cemetery, digging the place up and putting some of the bones on display, most Americans would probably be pretty disgusted by that idea. And so that's very insensitive and very inappropriate to do. Well, this happened time and time. That any museum that accepts any federal money, and this can come from a tax break, a grant, and direct funding, anything like that, they are required to return Native American remains and Native American sacred cultural objects. It was passed close to 30 years ago now. There's still many museums who are actively working at this. They're still finding more items uh, in the back. Collections can be extensive. There are people whose whole job is to figure out which items uh, need to go back uh, and to where. So uh, a great example of when, uh, was uh, skeletal remains found in 1996 uh, on the Columbia River uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And it turns out the remains uh, were something like 10,000 years old. Um, they were sent to a museum uh, to try and do this research with it being 10,000 years old. Is this person even Native American? Land strength, they might kind of predate most of the, the tribal groups in the area. We don't know who they repatriated to. The tribal groups have this claim. Kenny McManus went there, so said we need to bury him. This is inappropriate to do this research on. Courts, a few times, uh, they were fighting with the Army Corps of Engineers, who actually owned the land on which Kenny McMahon's remains were found. But uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, Kenny McMahon was finally uh, reburied uh, in a ceremony. They basically gave back to five directly with or with DNA or genetic evidence to connect them to those groups. So these are questions that sometimes the museum uh, itself can be just fine and dandy. Things like the 9-11 museum, well I shouldn't say that it's fine and dandy. The museum itself is, you know, appropriate. The museum uh, tells a powerful and compelling. Important to have, but probably not like so many museums today, they have like a museum gift store. And was it appropriate to sell a hat? Are you making money off of what is essentially a mass grave? There are a lot of New Yorkers who felt in, and uh, this museum making money off that. But a lot of museums also have to keep in mind, you have to raise funds uh, somehow. You know, how is that uh, going to be uh, raised? So that was a, a real, um, a, kind of a sensitive topic for sure, and something that off of uh, such a, a horrible tragedy like that. Um, uh, this one always uh, grossed me out just a little bit. The Body Works uh, was uh, an exhibit where there was a, a German uh, named uh, Hans, um, Hans Hagen, I think is his last name. and. Uh, uh, Gunther Hagen is his name, um, Gunther Hagen, um, and he found a way to basically plasticize where people can be made into plastic and you can examine the way muscles and ligatures and things like that come together and um, it was certainly uh, kind of provocative, certainly something that's pretty shocking to see someone with all their muscles in their skin, uh, but most of the people he had claimed had volunteered for this process, plasticized, put through this process when he passes away, 
uh, and become part of this exhibit. But he ran into trouble and they found out some of the bodies might not have volunteered. Some of the bodies were coming from places like China that might have been tied to like Chinese prisons. Percy can come in the form of the artifacts themselves. So the Abraham Lincoln Museum um, in Springfield back in 2007, uh, this friends group uh, took out loans. They paid $25 million. So everything from the gloves he was wearing that night at the uh, Ford's Theater when he was assassinated to locks, you name it. It was a whole treasure trove. But the, the um, most beautiful item in the collection was his hat, his stovepipe hat. Nothing is more associated with Abraham Lincoln than that hat. Um, and that hat with uh, and Abraham Lincoln go together so closely that the hat uh, provenance. So where did the hat come from? What is it really Lincoln's? And uh, basically, to make a long story short, after about a decade of uh, debate, going back and forth, trying to prove things with paper records, the hair for something like dandruff, and uh, match it up with Lincoln's DNA, and it was very inconclusive, enough so that it cast a lot of shadow of doubt that the hat was even uh, Lincoln's. So if you paid $10 million for a hat that you knew was Abraham Lincoln's is one thing, but if it turns out it's not him, the hat, it's the right size, it's the right style, it's from Springfield, the right maker, but that's how important knowing these artifacts if you just had a museum of nothing but replicas, probably wouldn't be too interesting. Might not draw too many people. How important is it that you have the actual item on display? That's what people come to see for, right? Um, so the curator there was actually uh, fired uh, about six months ago, and they still have to come up with something like $9 million to pay off the rest of that loan uh, from before, and they were looking at selling some items from the collection. That's uh, one other topic uh, I want to discuss uh, briefly here is how uh, do you prevent things from going to an auctioneer and having you know, an evil villain just buy up uh, the world's treasures. Well, I'll tell you, there's an ongoing example. This is very, very recent. Um, typically, uh, museum ethics would dictate if the museum from that sale has to go back uh, into uh, care of collections or for purchasing new collections. So the rector can't come in, sell an item, and then give himself a big raise with all the money he makes. That's, um, that's pretty unacceptable uh, in the Unacceptable in the museum world. The Edsel and Eleanor Ford House, many people here might have been to it, it's in Metro Detroit. Um, they just announced that they're going to be auctioning off this Cezanne. This is a Cezanne that uh, Edsel Ford bought in the 19th, estimating it's gonna bring in something like $25 million. Um, it's always controversial when a museum sells a piece of its uh, collection. They did this about six years ago, sold another Cezanne for something like $100 million, and then they used the money to pave the driveway. They then claimed that, well, the driveway was actually part, that's pretty, Pretty borderline, it's pretty questionable. Um, with this, they said, well, we're not, a, we're not an accredited museum by um, like, uh, some of the national museum organizations that do that. So we don't have to follow the ethical case of other museums look on with that with that, quite a throw around. It might not be something uh, the average person thinks about outside of uh, the museum world. Um, another very recent um, museum controversy that again could be its own whole show is what do you do with uh, controversial or racist statues? This is a statue, National Natural Museum, Natural History Museum in New York. Uh, we can see the idea was to again portray um, Teddy Roosevelt as this kind of hero naturalist, but uh, with him on the horse and the um, African person and the native person down to the sides, it was uh, pretty in an era with a, a much more racist intent. And it's kind of hard to put that into context when it's right out in front of your museum. It's not inside. You think like that. that statue just came down uh, last week. And obviously there's an ongoing national conversation which belong in a museum. They should be put in a museum, which I always want to remind people, don't forget to give the museum some money. They, they need some money to interpret that. You can't just drop it off like a baby on a doorstep. Um, so yes, so that's a little bit about some of the ongoing uh, museum uh, controversies um, to talk about, because there's definitely multiple sides to them. Uh, but I thought this excellent chance to uh, take some questions. Um, I know uh, Nathan is maybe co-running things. If there's a good way you can uh, maybe help me moderate or un unmute everyone, we can yeah. about museums. But otherwise, like I said, we've talked a little bit about the, the history, some of the controversies, and maybe where museums are going in the future.